Casey Joyner here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. One of the things we got to dive right into, Casey Joyner, has got to be what everybody seemingly is talking about, this helmet roll and every player, not every player, but a lot of high-profile players, past and present, are coming out, and it seems that there is a major, major disconnect between the players and the people who legislate this league. So uh, what do you see from this product right now and the way it's being called? I see it's a lot like what the catch rule was. For years, the catch rule was fans didn't know what it was, what's a catch. The announcers didn't know, and even when you talk to officials, they would be like, well, we think that's a catch, we think that's not a catch. Players aren't sure how they're supposed to hit. We've seen some plays where a player makes a tackle and just follows through, puts his shoulder into the belly, and seen like a, a quarterback rollout. I saw it on posted on Twitter a couple weeks ago. Somebody posted a... Uh, a quarterback rollout, naked boot, and then the defender comes up and tackles the quarterback and just drives him to the ground the way you're supposed to, form tackle, but because they said he drove his shoulder to the ground, they threw a penalty on it. I think if they can't tell the players exactly what's what's uh, what's legal and what's illegal, it's going to be a disaster once the season starts. Um, some of these seems like, uh, Casey, that it's the discretion of the official. If you're putting it into the hand of the officials, I think we're going to have big problems. Yeah, that's the thing. The NFL's always, over the years, they've done better when they, if you leave it up to the discretion of the officials, you say, okay, well, that's a 15-yard face mask penalty, or that's a 5-yard face mask penalty. For years, you'd wonder, okay, was that 15, was that 5? Occasionally, you'd see it was clear, but there were times you'd wonder, why did you call it a 15? That seemed incidental. You don't want to leave it in the officials' hands. If you leave it in the officials' hands, then the fans think that it's an arbitrary ruling rather than uh, a clear-cut ruling. So the more they can do to say this is a you know, make it a clear-cut rule rather than making it look like an arbitrary rule, the better off they'll be because if it's arbitrary, fans are automatically going to turn on the officials. Um, let me ask you, like, the league, actually, the, the league obviously is, is legislating this because they've been sued. So they're trying to take action to show, hey – Somebody had a problem. We are doing taking measures to try to fix it. We have players coming out, though, that are obviously not happy with the rule. Um, do you think that a majority of the players are okay with the way that things, you know, hitting and, and the head injuries? Or do you think a lot of people are happy that these rules are put into place and have just been silent on it? Uh, the offensive players are happy. They they like the idea that they can't get hit as hard. I guarantee you offensive players are a lot of them are on board with that idea. Or the defenders might be uh, might be afraid to get hit. Like look at the NFC Championship game. Well, Williams goes for he uh, he seemed to pull up on on the hit. You think he was thinking that maybe he might get a penalty if he goes for the hit? I'm thinking that might have been in the back of his head, and that's you know made for a memorable play, but it's a memorable play for the wrong reason because you know, he should be able to go over there and and hit that guy. I I always think when it comes to to trying to to legislate violence out of football. I remember going back to the 1920s, you know, way before any of us were born. But there's a New York Giants head coach named Steve Owen. He's in the Hall of Fame. He's one of the great coaches of all time. And Steve Owen, somebody asked him about the game one time, and he said football was created by a mean uh, I can't repeat what he said, but it, was, it starts with S O, <laughs> and he and he said it was created by a mean uh, and and, it, well, and and he said that the game is always going to be like this unless you, you know, unless you radically change the game, it's always going to be like this. And it, you know, you can take some violence out of the game, but I think the NFL and I was trying to go, we're trying to take so much of the violence out of the game more than probably they should, and it needs to be a point to where players are accepting that they're going to go on the field and you're going to have some problems with uh, you're going to have some some injury issues. You're going to have some some risk inherent with the with the endeavor and if you're not if you don't want to take that risk you know, don't show up yeah and i know uh, we had a caller earlier who brought up the point of like look you know when you have something these legis these guys who legislate the game the commissioner and the safety committees and the rules committees yada 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 it's their job to keep the players safe even if the players are not on board with it so my, I guess the question really is, like, are they cutting their nose to spite their face by putting these safety concerns in when the players aren't necessarily asking for them? If the players are being taught to form tackle, I'm not talking you know, they're, if they're, if a player is being told leave with your helmet, we'll you know we'll take the fine, we'll take the penalty, we'll figure it out. If they're being told that, that's one thing. But if it's a form tackle. And there, and you're just, and your, and your helmet happens to be in front of you at a certain angle. You're not leading with your helmet, but you hit, say, with the face mask. 
and, and, and it hits in a certain place, a certain area, and it looks like the, the, the helmet went a little high on things. If you're not meaning to, to hit somebody in a particular way, or if, if, you, if, I'm gonna put it, if you can't teach the players how to do a tackle. That sometimes, though, Casey, compelling. some of these tackles are like some of the complaints have been like Richard Sherman, you know, the head going with you. You know what I'm saying? Like I yeah. could be in the form tackle correctly, but then the, the, the offensive player makes a move which then puts me in a position that I didn't – it's, like, impossible to make the adjustment. I think that you need to do something along the lines of, of okay, spearing. Uh, you can't lead to the crown of the helmet. If you do the crown of the helmet, we're going to absolutely – you know, we're gonna we're going to throw you out of a game. We're gonna you're gonna get suspensions. I think they should be really strict on 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 that nature because you can tell players don't put your head down when you're making a tackle. Put your head up because if you keep your head up when you're making a tackle, it's almost impossible to spear somebody if you're looking at somebody. So that would get people to make more form tackles and make safer tackles. So take that sort of thing out. I also think that you know they want to get away from the the big hits with with the helmet and such. I think that they need to do uh, other things like if you're doing a a, a horse collar tackle. I, there are players, I think, now who do horse collar tackles the way, say, Vontez Burfik does horse collar tackles or does, does his tackling where he'll go and, and grab somebody and then slide, swing his legs out underneath the player. And, and I don't want to say it's the way to damage the player, but there's other ways to make tackles that don't put the other player into more risk. I think if you take a hard stance on those and say, we're not going to allow this, we're not going to allow that, sort of like the NFL did back in the day, they said, we're not going to allow head slaps. And or where actually they went from you can't do unlimited head slaps to you can do one head slap and then they said no head slaps and if you head slap people you would get penalized and you would get you know you could get fined you get thrown out of games go ahead and just take a hard line on a few issues and then leave the other issues to where they are because players can only do so much to control their bodies. Yeah, it's um, we were kind of dis- uh, debating back and forth on the entertainment value and the state of the current product. I mean, you've been covering this game a long, long time. Are you are you less entertained by the current product? I'm I don't like the idea that defensive players aren't going to try to hit players. Because defensive players look football offense is you know, you can do a lot of different play calling and offense. There's a lot of things you could do to get offense going. But defense, if you really start to look at defense, you can you can go back to the beginning days of football. Defense usually isn't we're gonna be where we're supposed to be when we're supposed to be there. Defense normally is Hmm, we're going to hit the offensive guy so hard he drops the football. We're going to hit the offensive guy so hard he doesn't want to catch the football. He's going to fumble it. He's going to be. That's what it's always been, mm-hmm. and that's part of what makes defense entertaining is that it, it's that mano e mano. I, I I can out tough you. The offensive player likes to think that, and the defensive player likes to think that. And I just think yeah, if you've got defensive players, put it this way: if you take, you go back to Walter Payton, one of the most aggressive running backs ever, who would take his forearm and hit it into somebody's face. How's the NFL handle that today? He's the offensive player, and he's going to take a forearm into somebody's face to, you know, to, to stop him from tackling things. Would they penalize him for that? Would they want to legislate that sort of thing out of the game? It's violence is inherent to this game, and it's part of the uh, enjoyment of the game. And you need to keep it safe as you can, but you can't eliminate it entirely, or else so then you, you're altering the sport. Have they gone too far? I think with this rule right now, because they don't know what they want to accomplish, they don't they don't know what the end product looks like. So I think they have gone too far because defensive players are now going to start pulling up for making tackles. And to see defensive players make half efforts or two thirds efforts because they don't want to get penalized, that's not good football. Uh, talk with Casey Joyner, uh, ESPN. dot com, uh, senior NFL and fantasy insider here on the Sports Bash ninety seven three ESPN. Uh, I do want to get into a little bit of your thoughts. Uh, we, we see that Wentz is back uh, on a, at 11 on 11s. Um, and, and most likely, if he doesn't play week one, he will probably be out there for week number two. But I want to ask you about Nick Foles. So many people, you know, of course here, he wins the Super Bowl. He's a Super Bowl MVP. The guy can walk on water. But do you think the Eagles potentially made a mistake by not trading him away when his value was at his highest? He got a Super Bowl window this year too. Wentz could get hurt in Week 13 again. Yeah, it it, it could happen. And if you if it happens, you've got a, a quarterback who can take you there. I love the idea of having a strong starting quarterback. I've said this many times, like the old school Raiders, strong starting quarterback like they had Daryl Monica. 
veteran backup who can come in and win games like they had in George Blanda, and then a great rookie on the bench you could develop for your future like they had in Kenny Stabler. It's probably the best quarterback trio in NFL history, what the Raiders had then, and I think teams should always aim for that. If you've got Wentz, who's your great starter, you've got Foles, who's a veteran backup who you know can come in and win the biggest games in the, in football. You know, you can win the Super Bowl, you can win the biggest games. You've got those two. I think you keep them together as long as you can because, again, if, if Wentz gets hurt, you've got somebody who can come in, and you've got a Super Bowl window. Win now. I mean, if you've got the window, you've got to go ahead and do it. So, no, I wouldn't have traded him. Um, I don't know how much you've seen or studied Nate Sudfeld, but he's looked pretty good in these first couple of uh, preseason games here. And it seems that, look, if Wentz got hurt for a game, two, three, that the Eagles would feel pretty comfortable going to him in that kind of situation. If you did feel comfortable with Sudfield, Sudfeld, in that case, would you consider moving Foles? If I had felt like he could be that way, possibly. But again, I like to have the veteran backup in there. I like the the the. the I pr- prefer as the backup to have the veteran quarterback because now you're moving somebody out of the out of the the, you know, the development role into the backup role, and now you've got to develop somebody else. And I just quarterback is such an important position. I know they could have gotten a lot. You know, they well, ostensibly could have gotten a lot out of it. And I, maybe if somebody called up Howie Roseman and said, "Hey, we're going to give you the the farm for him," that's fine. But also think about it this way. Quarterback right now, I do I do fantasy football rankings, and I'm finding that in you know, for, uh, that, that fantasy football, you're finding more value at quarterback than than I've ever seen in 15 years of doing this. And I think that you can translate that into the, from the NFL side to say quarterback might be as deep as it's ever been. Maybe two thirds of teams have really good quarterbacks, and there are other situations that aren't that bad. You could even say that maybe uh, if healthy, three quarters of the NFL teams have good quarterback situations. You've got that. Okay, Foles, you're going to trade him. Is somebody going to pay a big price to get their backup? Maybe, but if they're going to pay you a price for a backup quarterback, why not keep the backup? All right, uh, one of the things that factors into good quarterback play is a good offensive line. Casey Joyner ranks the offensive lines at ESPN.com in his latest Insider article. You gave the Eagles the ranking of the six best in the league, overall grade A, B, kind of break down what you see from the Philadelphia offensive line, which is essentially getting Jason Peters back so they should be even better than the team that won the Super Bowl last year. They should, and his comeback was the toughest part of the grades because I take I start with the 2017 grades and I take a bunch of advanced metrics, and I've got a formula put together to, to see where the teams rank. And their Eagles run blocking was a B plus. Their what I call stability and consistency, which is how you know, your personnel stability and your consistency of grades. I want to see teams have good grades across the board rather than one really good grade and a bad grade. They get an A minus there. The schedule is very fair. Well, they get an A minus there, but the pass blocking was a C. It wasn't great last year. It was solid, but it wasn't great. And Peters is 36 years old. He tore an ACL and an MCL. So I said, okay, I'm going to play it safe and act like they're going to be about where they were last year. But I think he can come back to somewhere close to his previous form, and you could raise that to a B, and if that was the case, they probably would have been among the top three teams in the league. So I think that the sixth grade is uh, is kind of actually safe for them rather than an aggressive one. Yeah, you look at uh, getting Peters back. You you uh, you know, you said he had a hard time with him. He's 36 years old. He's been hurt a couple times. That was a pretty big injury, too. That's not an injury that it's, a lot of players just come, you know, uh, right back into Pro Bowl form from. So we'll see what happens there. But across the front there, they, they do have – that continuity and stability that you gave them an A- minus for that should really help them out. And if they get that, having a quarterback, regardless of who it is back there, should help them. Yeah, it's on con- stability grade. They've got, they had, according to the, the snap counts, uh, they had 5,415 snaps last year of our offensive linemen, and they bring back 5,378. They bring back 99.3% of their snaps. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's that. And, in studying this, I've been studying this for a few years now, when you see teams, generally speaking, and I mean probably I would estimate 70% of the time, teams that keep their offensive lines together are the ones that do very well. When you get a lot of instability up there, even if you've got good players, you get instability. That's what causes problems because the players have to figure out how they're working together. So it's less talent in a lot of cases than it is stability. And the Eagles have talent and stability. So as long as they stay healthy uh, or even close to where they were last year health-wise, I think they're going to be a top-five team. And the interesting thing on your rankings, the Saints are one, the Falcons are two, the Rams are three, the Titans are four, the Patriots are five, the Eagles are six, the Steelers are seven. All the way up to those all playoff teams. The number eight team, though, Dallas, the number nine team, Chicago. Does that say that those two teams could possibly have turnaround type of seasons? 
they could, especially at Dallas, they had Ezekiel Elliott last year. He ranked 44th in a metric I have called good blocking yards per attempt. It measures how productive a back is when you give him quality run blocking. They gave him A-level blocking last year, and I think they'll give him A-level blocking this year. He's just got to do better when he gets good blocking. He's capable. He's done a lot better in that metric before, so I think he's going to spike in value. I worry a bit about their passing game, and I think they need to lean more on the running game because their pass blocking was a C. That's, that's their weakness, and I don't think – it's not like the Eagles were it's a C, and maybe I think they'll do better. I think they're – around that caliber. Maybe C-plus is about where they are. They're just not a good pass-blocking team. But Chicago's one that was uh, a, a big, uh, big, in- uh, ish, uh, big interesting one. Their plus was stability and consistency of B-plus, and their schedule is an A. So I don't know that talent-wise they're up where the other teams are, but they've got such a favorable schedule. They have what I call green-rated matchups, favorable matchups. They have four green-rated rush defense matchups and five green-rated pass rushing matchups. I think it's going to be a lot of instances where they're going to be able to get the most out of that offensive line just because they're facing a weak team. Casey Joyner is with us uh, looking at the Eagles and the NFL. Uh, a couple of NFL news today. By the way, uh, Adrian Peterson is back with the Redskins. Can Adrian Peterson still play? I, You know... They've got – their players last year did a poor job in the good blocking arch per attempt metric I just mentioned. They did not do well, and I, I think that they just don't have the kind of breakaway ability that you want out of your backs, and maybe Peterson could do that for you. But I'd still be very leery about him because Washington has run defense-wise. They've got the toughest schedule in the league run defense-wise. They, they've got a brutal set. I think they have six what I call red rated matchups, which is where it, it's a difficult matchup that you want to avoid. So I think nearly half the time, even if he's back there, they're going to have an issue. But the thing is, if you put, bring him out there, you've got Smudgy P. Ryan, you've got Rob Kelly, you've got Chris Thompson. Between those four, you could run a fairly solid committee. So their offensive line ranks 16th. I think that they're going to be okay as long as they're healthy, but uh, I wouldn't be thinking he's going to be an upside play. I think he'll be a committee guy. Uh, it, it seems that that's the way the league goes too, to the, to uh, you know more of a committee type of thing. But uh, it'll be interesting. He did not fit into uh, New Orleans at all. He seemed like he, he had his moments in Arizona last year. That just wasn't a very good team. No, it wasn't a very good team. They they're one of the worst offensive lines, so it, that would be an issue there. They also Washington. I still think they want to be more aggressive in the passing game. I think they. Cousins had some really good numbers over the past two years. He ranked tied for first in vertical touchdown passes. That's touchdown passes on passes thrown 11 or more yards downfield. So I think they're going to want to go vertical, and they think they just want to be able to power run the ball. And, again, you've got P. Ryan's had injury issues before. Thompson's had injury issues before. Rob Kelly is what he is. So I think if you add Peterson between them, you could like, you could rotate all those guys in and out, and you could go with one for a couple of games and just play the hot hand and keep the healthy back out there. I think that's more why they signed than anything else. They want to make sure they've got uh, enough health in their backfield. Uh, real quick, a uh, couple things to hit on with these rookie quarterbacks here. Uh, what are you thinking in Arizona where Rosen's look pretty good? I mean, Bradford, this poor guy, he gets signed with the Eagles. They draft a quarterback number two overall. He then goes to uh, Minnesota. He gets bounced out of there. And now he's in Arizona thinking, all right, I'm the guy here. They draft Rosen, and now it looks like Rosen's pushing him. Yeah, Rosen's pushed him, and whoever gets back there, the Cardinals returned the lowest percentage of offensive line snaps this year. They lost their starting setter to a season-ending injury. Um, yeah, Bradford is Bradford's perfect role is what Nick Foles is doing. He's a, you know, a veteran backup who you know could win games. He's got that kind of talent. That's what he should be. Now, can the rookie come in? Can Rosen come in and be that guy? Maybe, but if you're Arizona you think Rosen could be ready to go, fine. Have Rosen as your starter. Bradford's a very good backup to have out there, a veteran backup that can, you know, again, we saw how valuable it was in Philadelphia last year. That, that's what he should be at this point in his career. And if he does it, if he is willing to take on that role, he can have five, six, seven more years in the league because he, if he tries to be a starter those years, he's going to eventually just get knocked out from injuries uh would you start tyrod taylor in cleveland or do you think that the right move is to go with baker mayfield uh unless mayfield is blowing you away i'd probably still go with tyrod taylor um mayfield i really like his college tape and he's a very aggressive player and such but if he goes out there and wins his teammates over and then goes out there and lays an egg on the field i think it's a it's a, it's a worrying situation and again you've got a, a, a quality starter in taylor go ahead, put him out there and let mayfield until you know mayfield is ready right now you, i don't know that you can say that in the preseason i think you could do a better job of gauging that during the season sam darnold in new york or t- Teddy Bridgewater. Teddy Bridgewater, Teddy Bridgewater, Teddy Bridgewater. I really like Sam Darnold a lot, but Bridgewater has shown that he could be a starter in this league. Get a year out of him. He will, he will give you quality play. He's put up good numbers everywhere he went. 
He said uh, he passed all the Parcells rules coming out of college. I think you put Bridgewater out there and you say, Darnold, go ahead and develop for a year. I think Darnold could be that guy, but go ahead. You brought Bridgewater in. Why not utilize him? Uh, does it, appears, it appears that Josh Allen might win by default uh, out there with the Bills, but if it was McCarron against Allen, Nate Peterman's still in the mix. Would you go with Allen over McCarron? I'd go with Allen because the other two, I don't, I, again, you can look at Rosen versus Bradford and say, can Bradford be the guy? He could be the guy, or he could be, you know, he could be your starter for a year and such. I think you look at McCarron and you look at Peterman, you know what they are. And you, you brought in Allen to be your guy. Since you don't have anybody else to, to beat him out, and he's got that phenomenal arm, go ahead and put him out there because uh, in that case it doesn't behoove you because you're not getting anything necessarily better than him. Uh, Casey joined us with us here, and then, of course, we know that uh, Lamar Jackson has really surprised and, and looked pretty good and uh, you know has been energetic to that team. But uh, do you think he gives them a better shot to move the ball than Flacco? I think he probably does, but I think they want to do with him like they did with the uh, Pittsburgh Heads Flash back in the day, Cordell Stewart. I think they should do that with him this year and say, we'll find packages, we'll find places to put you in here and do something. Because the reports you read out of Baltimore say that Flacco has done like Smith did in Kansas City last year. When you get a veteran quarterback who's got a rookie suddenly breathing down his neck and he suddenly steps his play up, I think that's going to motivate Flacco to do one more year. So go ahead and get Flacco out there one more year, find packages to get – you know, to take advantage of Jackson's skills, but don't don't put him out there because Jackson he needs to show by the way that he can uh, handle a pass rush because when you get a pass rush at Louisville, when Houston's pass rush came after him that one game, he kind of folded his tent. I want to see that he can handle a pass rush. All right, uh, that's a look at uh, all the rookie quarterback situations. Casey Joyner here on the Sports Patch Week Three of the NFL preseason Thursday night. The Eagles take on the Cleveland Browns, and you can hear that game right here on 97.3 ESPN. Casey Jones, like all guests, appear via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline. Thanks, pal. Appreciate it.